There are some folks out there that say that DAX are boring, all DAX are basically the same. Well, I think those people just haven't really been paying attention. Hello, I'm Massa Marslander, and this is actually part two of a three-part video series covering the Ferrum Audio Stack. Today, we're talking about the Wandala, but if you haven't seen the first video where we talk about the amplifier, the ore, I highly encourage you to go and watch that first as all these videos are going to be kind of connected. So I do encourage you to watch that first and then come back to this video. The Wandala here is a really incredible and amazing device, and I can't wait to talk about it. But first, full disclosure, once again, that Ferrum Audio has sent these units to me for these reviews, but as always, all thoughts, words, and opinions are going to be my own. So there is a lot to talk about with this device. Oh my gosh, I don't know how long this video is going to be, but let's go ahead and get started with the easiest, which would be the build. So here it is, the Wandala. Now it probably looks pretty similar to the ore and that's because, well, it's basically the exact same build, both in quality and aesthetic. It is just this nice, matte black sheet metal kind of stamped and molded together and the front here we have our again corton steel nice rusted aesthetic ferrum logo right there then it is a nice contrast to the rest of the build what's different though is there's basically no front ui other than this very simple very linear volume dial and then this right here is actually a color touch display and this is where you're going to be able to do the vast majority of control of the unit is from that display. It does, however, also come with a remote. It's a pretty standard basic remote, but it does a good job. And if you want to be able to control the unit remotely, boom, there is your option for that. Remote. We go to the back of the unit. Look at all this freaking IO we have. We have so many options here. It's, it's pretty insane. And again, kind of shows the value of this unit. First off, we have our full balanced outputs here for XLR, and then we have single-ended RCA outputs right here. Next to those, we have our inputs. We have our analog RCA inputs as well as an AES input. So this can very easily be run as a preamp, and it's a pretty dang solid one at that. Next, we have our coaxial and of course optical. But right here, that right there is going to be pretty exciting for some people. This is an HDMI arc in right there. So this makes this unit very, very easy to connect to a home theater system. Likewise, there's also a I2S HDMI in. To be perfectly honest, I'm not 100% sure what that is, what I2S HDMI is. I tried to look it up and I couldn't find a very clear answer. So, so if you know, if you watching know what that is, please make a comment about it because I'd love to understand what the heck that's about because we'll, we'll see this mentioned again when we're exploring more of the unit but yeah i don't really know what hdmi i2s is and i could not find a very reliable source to make it easy to understand next of course we have USB-C in then we have this trigger right here this is so you can activate the unit from an external device or vice versa where this unit can activate external devices so that's neat our basic DC in for 22 to 30 volt power. And then the last piece of the unit right here, which we saw on the OR, this is the FLP or Ferrum power link adapter so that you can connect the Wandla to the Ferrum Hipsis. Again, we'll talk more about connecting these units to the Ferrum Hipsis in the Hipsis video coming next week. So yes, you could connect this to the Hipsis along with your OR. So there's your unit on the outside there. Very, very cool, very simple build. It's really identical to the ore in many, many ways, but man, do you have a lot of freaking options back here for UI. So many things you can do here. And yes, again, you can run this as a preamp if you wanted to. Now, the internals of this unit are extremely impressive, especially at this form factor. It's amazing that they were able to fit so many high quality components in such a small unit. But I am a very simple man with a very simple channel that talks about audio in very simple terms. So I'm not going to waste a bunch of time in the video to open this up and go over all the 
minutia of the internals of this thing. So instead, I encourage you to check this video out here. I'll also have a link in the description that goes to Ferrum's own breakdown video of the internals of this unit. And man, it, it because it really does have some really impressive components under the hood here. But Ferrum themselves does a much better job of explaining those components and how they all work together in tandem and communicate with each other than I ever could. So if that's something you really want, you really need, again, I encourage you, go watch the Ferrum video. They will be able to break that down to you better than I ever could. The specs. So just like before, I'm going to throw the specs on screen right here. There's a lot to look at here and we're not going to go over all of it. So by all means, if you want to take a deeper look at what's on here, go ahead and pause the video and read this out yourself. But there's only a couple things on here I want to highlight. First thing I want to point out is the chip. It's an ESS Sabre chip. It is the ES9038 Pro. Next thing I want to point out is the DAC resolution, which can go all the way up to 768 kilohertz at 32 bits and also has support for DSD-256. It also does support MQA with a built-in detector and renderer if that's important to you, and a frequency response range between 10 hertz and 200 kilohertz. Wow, that is way overkill, but cool as hell. So now we'll just put all that away, and next we'll talk about the software and what it's like to actually use the unit. So here's the basic home interface. And what we see here is we see our volume, some buttons, our input, and then the signal. Right now there's no signal, but as soon as I start to play something, first it shows off the audio resolution, but it also shows off the actual bit rate of the file. So there's no guessing what kind of resolution bit rate you are getting from your audio files. Right in the front here, the only real control we have besides the touchscreen is the volume knob. I move that and it very very, very smoothly and linearly moves that volume up and down. This giant knob will rotate continuously, 360 degrees, but it is extremely smooth. And again, very much like the ore, it's a very gradual amount of volume adjustment. Up here, we could tap to mute the device or unmute it. Then this button here, boop, that brings up all of our insane amount of options for settings. We're gonna go through these one by one real quickly. Standby will obviously put the unit into a standby mode. If we tap audio, this is where we get all sorts of very, very cool features. Your first option is that you are able to change what type of volume control you want. Do you want analog volume or do you want digital volume control? And if ever you're not sure what you're looking at, you can always click on the information icon here, tap it, and it'll actually describe to you what changes. So you could look at this and read it out get an understanding of what you're actually changing. It's amazing, my gosh. Close that. So yes, you do have your option of analog or digital volume control. Next up is the upsampling menu. And it's in here that you're gonna see all of the Wandula's various dynamic digital filtering options. These are all basically profiles, filters built into the Wandula that do change the sound sometimes in pretty significant ways. We'll talk more about these different individual profiles when we Get into sound performance. Up next is our bypass. This is where you would turn the bypass on or off if you're not sure what that does. Again, click that information icon and it'll tell you right there. This is what regulates all the inputs. It's useful for using the Wandula with external pre-amplifiers. So yes, this will basically make it so that you can no longer control the volume on the unit itself and that you will be controlling all the volume on an a external device. Similarly, we also have our theater bypass which again, volume regulation for the analog input. It makes it just that much more exceptional for home theater systems with multi-channel AV receivers and other built-in volume controls. Output balance. This is where you can decide how much of your audio you wanna come out of which channel, your left channel, your right channel, and again, balance it out for whatever reason you might need to balance out your audio. You have your digital input trim. You would use this to help match the levels of the Wandula with different amplifiers. Next, we have our analog input gain. If you're, again, not sure, tap that info button. You can trim or gain signal of analog input. Again, this is basically just another way to make it easier to kind of match your different equipment, matching the Wandula with different amplifiers and other kinds of audio equipment. And then we also, at the very end here, have some options for the i2s hdmi input 
where you could do SDT 32-bit or MSB 32-bit, as well as changing the input DSD pin. And here's your options there, all the way up to pin 16. Next, we have our visuals menu. In here is where you can change the various visual assets of the device. So I can go in here, I can change how bright I want this display to be. I tend to like it around 70, but your mileage will vary. I can go back and also change the brightness of the logo rather than like we saw on the OR, where the brightness adjustment was an a actual physical analog wheel. It's all digital in here. So I would in here be able to adjust how bright I want that logo to be. And as you can see there on the side of the screen, I can even have that logo off if I want to, even while the unit is on. And not only do you adjust the brightness of the logo itself, but also how the logo behaves. So like logo standby brightness, you can change too. So you could have you know, the logo be a different brightness depending on what kind of status the unit is in. And the logo also will adjust brightness automatically if you want to with the ambient sensitivity, which you could then adjust in here. You can either turn it off or adjust just how harsh that ambient sensitivity really is. You can determine your screen auto off timer to never all the way down to five seconds. And then finally in here, you can adjust how long the unit takes to automatically return to the home screen when there is no activity being made on the device itself. So if we wait here for 30 seconds without doing anything to it, it will automatically go back to the home screen. But if we want to, we could choose for it to never do that or to do it all the way up to as quickly as every 10 seconds. We'll keep going into control because of course we need to have even more control in here. Oh my gosh. You have your trigger direction from input or output. You have your power up mode, standby or working. How much time you want the device to take to automatically turn off. Whether or not you want the device to automatically wake up and whether or not you want the device to automatically detect your input. So again, just so much freaking control of this thing and we're still not even done yet. We can actually keep going. In here is where you can find contact information to get support if you need to, information on your device, and a restore button if for whatever reason you need to completely reset the entire DAC. So just an absolute crap ton of options and features in this thing that just give you all the control you could ever freaking need. So yes, an absolute mind-bending amount of customization and options and control of this DAC. That's kind of the word of the day for this thing. Control. You can control everything about this freaking thing. And I've never really seen a DAC that had this much versatility and again, just this much control by the user. It's super impressive. And now let's talk sound performance. Much like the OR, and I think this is going to be pretty common amongst the entire lineup here, this is an extremely neutral and natural sounding DAC with just a whole lot of realism. This sounds so real. It doesn't do any kind of flavoring or coloring to your sound. It's just a very, very transparent and honest DAC. And man, does it sound very, very real. It's extremely detailed, but not ever in a very kind of clinical and sterile sort of way. It's always been fun while being just extremely detailed and allowing you to really analyze your music without being bored by it. It pairs very, very well with every deck I have here on my testing bench. And for every amp that I have connected this to, I'm getting additional soundstage and I'm getting much clearer image separation, much greater image separation as well. So that's kind of what this really benefits to your amplifier, whatever the amplifier is. Extra imaging and extra soundstage right out of the box. So for me to give you a thorough idea of what the DAC sounds like, I'm gonna have to give you a little bit of a description of what the individual filters sound like. The first filter is an ESS line pH. This is a linear phase filter. And with this filter enabled, the sound is very, very focused. It's very linear. You have a ton of detail. It's it's fairly intimate. You're not getting a huge amount of extra soundstage out of it. It's just a kind of a rawness to for, right from the chipset, basically. But it's it's very dynamic and it's very vocal forward. Vocals are kind of the center point of that particular filter. But 
it's a really wonderful experience. Again, a lot more intimate than the other filters and not as wide in terms of soundstage, but it's, it's so clear and it's so detailed and dynamic. It's still a blast to listen to. The next filter is the HQ short filter. This is starting out with the kind of HQ profiles. You get a wider soundstage right out of the gate and it is noticeable. I'm already talking about how the DAC itself just is kind of adding some width to stuff. Well, you're getting even more width when you're adding that HQ filtering. So yes, right out of the gate, noticeable additional soundstage. And the mid range becomes even more forward. Vocals kind of stay a little bit where they are, maybe push back a little bit further, but the entire mid range becomes more present, comes more forward, where while the bass and the treble range not necessarily get recessed, but they get pushed a little bit further away. They're not as intimate as they were with the ESS filter. They're a little bit more spread out and a bit more extension too on both ends. Next, we have the HQ APOD MP filter, MP being minimal phase. This actually extends the soundstage even a little bit wider than before and further extends the bass range and the mids. So the mids are now a little bit less forward, a little bit less intimate. It's almost like it's making everything sound just a little bit more generally spread out, a little bit more wider, kind of all across the frequency response, but you're still maintaining just really excellent detail. Next filter is the HQ APOD filter and APOD just being short for apodizing or apodizing, apodizing, whatever. Once again, still slightly wider than the previous filter, but this one has a little bit more emphasis on the bass range. The bass range gets a little bit more, even more extended. It's hitting a little bit harder. It's a bit more present. I'd say maybe your mid bass is coming forward a little bit more to give you a bit more rumble and kick. While at the same time, your vocals are also starting to become a little bit more present again. Not quite so much as it was with the ESS filter, but they're coming out just a little bit more, especially your female vocals. So maybe the high, the high mid range is what's kind of being emphasized a little bit more too. So. That, that's pretty, probably what it is. A little bit more emphasis in the mid bass and a little bit more emphasis in kind of the mid treble. The last filter currently available on my unit here is the HQ Gauss filter. And this basically is the widest sounding of the filters and it doesn't really emphasize any part of the frequency. Basically everything just feels like it has this general distance from you. Everything's pushed away to give you a real nice amount of sound stage and immersion while also giving you just really, really precise imaging. Everything's a little bit, maybe a little bit smoothed out more than it is in the ESS filter, but you're not really losing detail. It's just not quite as focused as it is with the ESS. The Gauss filter here is kind of the antithesis of the ESS filter, where ESS is super, super focused. The Gauss filter is extremely wide and just very immersive. So this DAC, I mean, man, it, it gives you so many ways to control it. Again, the word of the day is control here. Not only in how you can control the unit itself, not only in how the unit can control your music, but just, man, you can make your music sound kind of however you want with this damn thing. All those filters, they, they really do do, they really do such a great job. And it's not super intense changes you're getting out of those filters either, to be clear. It's not like going from one HQ filter to another is a huge difference in sound quality or a huge difference in sound performance in certain areas. They're just subtle differences. So you're still getting the general sound of the DAC, but it's just emphasizing it in very kind of subtle ways here and there. So it, it's just, it's super, super cool, man. And I really can kind of pick and choose almost what kind of sound I want this to be producing to me, depending on what kind of music I'm listening to. And just the sheer amount of control you have of the entire unit. You could do so many things with this freaking box and you have total control. You just complete user control with this DAC. So much more than I've ever seen in any other DAC to date. So it is an incredible DAC and is to date the most, by far most capable DAC I have here on my testing, on my testing bench, but it is expensive. $2,800 is a very hard sell for a DAC in general. To be clear, it's not like this is going to be two to 300 times better than a $300 DAC, okay? We're talking about real diminishing returns here, but if you're the kind of person that just, you need to have those 
extra little minute details, those extra little minutia, that extra little bit of perfection, maybe the cost makes more sense to you. If you're gonna be comparing this to something like say a ship Modi, to use a car analogy for you, the ship Modi is probably like your Toyota Corolla, it'll get the job done and it does a good job at doing it. The Wandel is like a straight up Ferrari, an, act an actual crazy ass hypercar. Way more than you could ever really ask for, to be honest. It has so many features, so much technology is put into this thing. So yes, it is a very expensive DAC, but if you're the kind of person that just needs to have all that technology, all that to be able to hear all that little minutia in all those different ways and have this amount of control, well, that's gonna be up to you whether or not the cost justifies that. But it is an absolutely incredible DAC and completely breaks the mold of DAX being the same and DAX being boring. There's nothing boring about this thing. Oh my gosh. You can lose yourself with how much there is to control here and play around with. Nothing boring or samey about the Wandala here. It is wholly unique in the DAC world in my opinion. So that about wraps up for this video, but stay tuned for part three of this three part series where we're going to wrap this whole lineup up with the Ferrum Hypsis. We're going to talk about the Hypsis itself and also what changes in the entire stack when all these units are connected together. It's going to be a good one. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you again soon.